<clears throat> um, 10 minutes before we were supposed to sit down and record this podcast episode, <laughs> I got a certified letter in the mail. JF on YouTube.com. You, you can see it. You can see it right here. Um, let's see. What, why would someone send me a certified letter? I, you know, because listen, we're, we're trying to be positive on this podcast. Maybe it's a note of encouragement. Maybe it's, maybe it's money. That could be, it could be money. <laughs> could be. It, that could be a reason that someone would send me a certified letter. Because listen, it's, it's so important to keep your mind focused on the positive. I, I'm always telling you guys, you should ask when you're having a stressful time in your life, if, if you've been ill for a very long time, if you have a deep vein thrombosis and, and like can't get treatment for it and, and you've felt bad for so long, you don't even remember what it feels like to feel um, good anymore. It's so important to say, what if it's great? What if it's great? <laughs> What if the contents of this certified letter are great? What if it's like like I have I have an uncle like a daddy Warbucks sort of figure <laughs> that I didn't even know about and it's like he passed away and he's been following the good work that you are doing and he wanted to leave his entire fortune to you and he was an early investor in Microsoft. So you know, this is what the certified letter is about. So it could be all of those things. Um mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see what it actually is, friends. I can't, for legal reasons, show uh, this letter at all. On <laughs> <laughs> my husband Joe just walked into the podcast studio. He's very nervous. He's very nervous. Um, this, the letter says, "Dear, uh, dear Ms. Fulweiler." Uh, okay, I won't read it verbatim, but um, they. Uh, it is. It is from a unnamed hematology practice well they they are named but i'm not naming them to you um i am banned from their entire practice <laughs> for quote threats of violence i just got right right before i mean caitlin was parking her car when i received a certified letter saying that i am banned from a hematology practice due to threats of violence <laughs> um now i shall read a letter uh crafted in conjunction with my attorney <laughs> who was probably listening at the door um okay the, here's 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 the letter uh, this is the legal letter i am a comedian and recently i vented frustration about the difficulty i was having getting an appointment as part of an ongoing medical emergency that i am experiencing all statements on this subject were jokes. I have been contacting many hematology offices. I have seen many hematologists in the past. And the, what's that say? Oh, and the various humorous statements I made were occasioned by my interactions with many different offices. Now, I will not name <laughs> the office that sent me this letter. Um, May I just tell you a story that could could be about them or not or not before my attorney actually <laughs> bursts through the doors and tackles me um, while I am recording this. Could, may, did, do, could I do a storytelling music, Caitlin? I did. Let's maybe I'm making it up. Maybe I'm making it up. Obviously, I'm delusional. Maybe maybe this is about no one. Maybe this is something that happened in a dream, but like it could be something that could happen in life is that you could call a office and, and have a very similar interaction with multiple offices, multiple offices, this <laughs> happened a lot, um, but it could, so just, you, you could call a office, okay? You could, in theory, you could. And you could call them on Monday and you could say, um, the emergency room told me that I really need treatment. Um, because I have a very large deep vein thrombosis. Um, so could I get an appointment? And they, like many other offices, could say, um, someone will call you back. 
So then you could call the next day and say, so update, um, I'm having symptoms of internal bleeding and my pharmacist personally called me, the pharmacist called me and said, I'm concerned about this, uh, this dose that you're on. I told her some of my symptoms and the pharmacist said, ooh, ooh, uh, that's, that's bad. Uh, you, you really need to see a hematologist. So I, I could have called a, a variety of offices, many, many, like the stars counting the number of hematologist offices I called would be like trying to number the stars in the sky. So I, so I could have called an office and said, hey, so let, let's say this is the third business day with no call back. I could say, hey, I have symptoms of internal bleeding and my pharmacist just personally called me to say that she's really concerned about the dose that I'm on. So I'm a sympathetic person. I, I could also say, look, I, if you guys are busy, I understand, but could could you give me some transparency on when I might get a call back? Or if the answer is it, it's not going to be possible this week or for the next couple of weeks, th that's actually fine. I just need to know so that I can plan. I could have had that conversation with a lot of offices, many offices. Um, so, and then and then another, and then I could be told that. Um, They'll just call you back. I, I could get blown up. Like, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll we'll call you back. And another business day could go by, and 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 then this could potentially end with me joking on social media and getting banned from the an office that just consistently blew me off when I said. I am having symptoms of internal bleeding. No other medical professionals want to touch this because we are also trying to treat a DVT. So I could have vented my frustration about this, ab about my interactions with many different offices on social media. And then an office who is one of many who kept not calling me back, despite me calling every single day, they banned me from their office. That's something that could happen. I'm not saying it did happen. <laughs> May, maybe I'm making that up. Maybe the certified letter I have here is actually from a, from a mystery uncle who is, he's <laughs> like, Jen, I'm just a fan. You know, I wanted to encourage you. I just, I feel like, you know, I just saw how famous you're getting on YouTube. I say that's going really well. <laughs> you used to get seven views for every video and now you get 10. And I just, I feel like things are taking off. And think of this as an investment in your career. Maybe that's what the letter said. Maybe that, maybe, maybe none of this happened and I'm making it all up. Do, do you feel like my attorney will be happy with how I, I have handled this? Um, so I'm, <laughs> I think I can say legally, uh, I, I am banned from a hematology practice. <laughs> that will remain unnamed. Um, so this is this is a bit of a setback. Um, I was diagnosed with a deep vein thrombosis two and a half weeks ago. We are coming up on the three week uh, anniversary, if you will. <laughs> I'm running out of the evidently kind of crazy dose of medicine that the emergency room gave me. Um, no other doctors want to touch this because I have I have a unique clotting disorder uh, that it's homozygous. I got it from both parents. It's it's a little bit of a mess, and so you, figuring out how the interactions with the medicine work with treating the DVT, like I you know I need I need specialized treatment. So this is a bit of a setback. It's a bit of a setback. Um, that wasn't on my bingo card actually <laughs> for for this year. Um, getting banned from a hematology practice was was not on my bingo card. But that's fine. They they you know they have a right to. Um, not see crazy people <laughs> if they don't want to. I, that's fine. They they don't have to see me. That's fine. Um, I just uh, I just didn't expect this setback. I felt like I I kind of I liked them actually. I thought that we might be getting close to getting an appointment with them. Um, 
So I don't know how much else I can say legally, but uh, I liked them for what it's worth. And um, I'm surprised that I got banned. I am surprised, but I will I will honor their decision. <laughs> I will not be making any appointments there. Um, and I would back to the drawing board, guys. Back to the drawing board. Do I? Maybe I'll go to Europe. Maybe I'll just you know I'll find a European hematologist. I'll start over. I'll live, you know, I'll live in a bog in Ireland. I'm just going to start my life over in in like a different country. And um, just maybe they can find, you know, I'll be able to get hematological care there. So that's what's new with me. This episode will be a little different because um, that was a bit of a setback. That was a bit of a blow. And again, it literally happened while... Caitlin was parking her car to record this episode. So this news is is very new um, that, you know, not not everyone has a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> not everyone enjoys a good chuckle, a good laugh. <laughs> you know, one take on that. One take on my content could have been let's let's have a laugh. It wasn't even about them. The, and, they, and they could have been like, isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? <laughs> Aren't the yucks fun? You know, they could have started a podcast if they thought I was talking about them, which I wasn't. They could have started a podcast and talked about me and we could have had a beef and it could have been fun. But not everyone <laughs> likes fun. Not everyone likes humor. Um, just a, a bit of a, a bit of a laugh, a bit of a chuckle. So um, that's fine. I will take my humor somewhere else. I will go. <laughs> I will go elsewhere. Um, my final statement on this issue, uh, let's read from the, the the scraps of paper that I tore up here from my attorney. Um, I guess what I'd like to say in conclusion is that I didn't choose the thug life. The thug life chose me. This is <laughs> none of this is my fault. I just I just find myself in these situations. Is this Caitlin? Is this what people are talking about when they say I have chaotic energy? Oh, I would say because <laughs> yeah. you guys you say that in the Apple podcast reviews and I and I used to be perplexed by that. <laughs> I used to say, what do they mean? I'm not I'm not chaotic. And then, you know, I listened back like let, let's <laughs> review for new listeners, um, including the folks at, at this at this hematology practice that just banned me. I, I take it they'll they'll probably be tuning in. Welcome, new listeners. Don't leave an I Apple Podcast reviews, guys. Like just no, let's let's not. Um, <laughs> but um, when I listen back to what I have conveyed to you all in the past few weeks, it gives me a little more clarity on why people say I have chaotic energy because a summary of the past few episodes is like let's go back a few weeks here so I was yelling at my husband at yacht club trivia night (laughs) over the definition of macrame because I was very obsessive about our team the narwhals conquering everyone else at yacht club trivia night However, I was short of breath while I was yelling, and I thought that was due to scurvy because I'd been having some weird medical (laughs) symptoms and also reading a lot of um, books about 16th century seafaring. So I convinced myself that I had scurvy, and I was telling everyone at the Yacht Club in between yelling about trivia answers that I had scurvy. It turns out I didn't have scurvy. I had a blood clot from a blood clotting disorder that I knew that I had and wasn't on blood thinners for for various reasons that would bring you into the Byzantine complexity of, of how my mind works and would take too long to explain. And so then I went to the emergency room where I encountered a woman in labor, a very cheerful one-armed man, um, and a kid who was screaming with a broken arm. I told some stories about that. I ended up getting um, some blood thinners after the, uh, the deep vein thrombosis diagnosis, the prescription of which there was a little question about whether this is the best prescription for me to be on. And as part of um, my experience with many different offices trying to get an appointment with a hematologist. I made some jokes like the comedian that I am and ended up getting 
banned from a hematology practice. Is that what people mean by chaotic energy? <laughs> Maybe just a little. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it it feels so normal to me, this existence that I'm living. I, I, and now it's funny to look back that I would I would read the, the Apple podcast reviews and I'd be like, cha- chaotic. <laughs> I'm not I'm a I mean, my existence, it, it's like a placid lake. I mean, there's nothing <laughs> chaotic. <laughs> it's a little chaotic. <laughs> Certified letters. <laughs> certified letters showing up right before I record a podcast episode. And it's funny because everyone's like, all right, do you have a hematologist appointment? Do you have a hematologist appointment? Well, not now. <laughs> not now. But before we move on to other subjects, I, I do want to let you guys know, I have found a hematologist and, um, you know, he's actually here with us now. If you guys want to <laughs> meet him um, here, this, this is my new hematologist. <laughs> uh, this is, I, I think it's going really well. Hey, um, I am having symptoms of internal bleeding, but we're still trying to treat this deep vein thrombosis. Should I go down on the medication? Let's, let's ask, let's ask the hematologist. Um, Oh, it says yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, for those of you listening on audio, uh, this is a magic eight ball that I am holding. <laughs> and that is where we are in my hematology journey. <sighs> okay. So this, so this is my, this is an actual life that somebody is living. <laughs> Man, this is, uh, so you know what's great that some of you guys know, there's there's a guy who has a famous radio show named Lino Ruli. I'm a regular on his show. It's on Sirius XM. He has a producer named Tyler who is known, you know, Ty- Tyler's a, I don't know, he's, he's mainly known for like being an atheist, being sarcastic. And Tyler is, he's, he's one of my good friends and I like him so much. And what's funny is that he's an atheist, but he, uh, I swear God worked through him. He wrote me this really kind handwritten note. It was, it was like the kindest thing anyone has done in so long. It was so sweet. It was like, Jen, I know you've had a hard time with your health. I've been worried about you. I don't pray because I'm an atheist, but I'm, you know, I'm sending you thoughts for whatever that is worth. And it was so sweet. And that arrived at the exact same time as the certified letter. So first of all, it, it just goes to show God can work through anyone, even atheists. <laughs> and it also it, it also goes to show even when you're having a hard time. Like, for example, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you're a comedian who makes some jokes, <laughs> some <laughs> jokes and gets banned from a medical office due to them. Um, there will still be some little blessings along the way. Our last episode was called Dumpster Fire. Um, no improvement in that. I mean, it just keeps getting worse. But you will find blessings in the dumpster fire. You know, it's like you'll be in the dumpster and it's on fire. And then it'll be like, oh, hey, there's that earring that I lost. You know, under Underneath the rotting lettuce over there. Like, hey, there it is. Like, there are blessings in the dumpster fire. You just have to look for them. Even even when your life is at its worst, you, you will be able to find blessings in the dumpster fire. So, all right, let, let me, I, ha- I haven't introduced the show yet. I don't know what the topic is today because I'm a little bit distracted and now I have a lot on my to-do list. I have to figure out what to do about the situation. But welcome to the Jen Fulweiler show where we evidently have really chaotic <laughs> energy. Um, I'm your host, Jen, banned from only one medical office, only one. So far. All the, yeah, well, so far. Yeah, well, Caitlin points out, you know, we haven't released this episode yet. So, um, so far, only one. Um, I am a mom of six, stand-up comic, uh, best-selling author, and, and I have a deep vein thrombosis that will never be resolved. Um, I'm just going to live with it. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle and I'm just going to live the, the DVT lifestyle. Um, this is the podcast where you learn the art of the village hustle. That's being a hot girl, girl boss or hot boy, boy boss who knows that love and family and community are the foundations of all true success. We publish episodes every Wednesday morning, even when we're getting threatening certified letters. It's we, we, we don't miss an episode. Uh, every Wednesday morning, new episodes come out. Um, 
Rhonda Smith is our producer. Uh, that's, you know, not her name, but I think at this point with the <laughs> reputation <legal> that <laughs> I have. Yeah, I think she, our, our, you know, our producer doesn't want to be publicly associated with me anymore. So uh, we, we were actually going to announce an exciting project that she has, but we won't. We'll give that some space. Maybe in a future <laughs> episode, when we pretend all of this never happened, uh, we will uh, we, we'll we'll go back to talking about what Rhonda <laughs> has going on. That that would be funny if you put on like sunglasses, you know. So, actually, look, there are glasses on the table <laughs> well, yeah. right there. Yeah. So um, so Rhonda is our producer. Um, certainly nobody named Caitlin has anything to do with me. Uh, she is an upstanding citizen who, uh, she has cut all of her ties with me. So that's that Rhonda will, is producing today. <laughs> and, see. um, don't forget to leave, leave a, leave a, well, no, may, maybe don't leave a review. I don't know. My luck isn't going well. So maybe don't leave a review, but join the Patreon, <laughs> join the Patreon. This cause, oh, oh, also on top of all of this, I have to be on this medication for life if, anyone will ever write me a prescription for it. Um, right now, the dose I'm on, a 21-day supply is what was it, $716. Yeah, I, I played that audio <laughs> in the last episode. So it's it, right now, 21-day supply is 700 I think we'll get it. It'll be like 450 a month. So yeah. join my Patreon, patreon.com slash this is Jen. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, let me start. This, this episode is not as... <laughs> it's going to flow more loosely than some of them. Um... <laughs> I was thinking about Tyler, Tyler Vecti, the the executive producer on Lena Ruli's show uh, on Sirius XM channel 129. And I, it's interesting how e- even though he is he's a lifelong atheist, something I can relate to. I don't mean like I'm an atheist now because of <laughs> everything that's <laughs> happening. I mean, I was a lifelong atheist before I um, before I joined the Catholic ghetto. And but uh, it, it's interesting how. God can work through anyone and and I think that I think a lot of people are closer to God than they realize. I think a lot of people are they they are encountering God, they just don't realize it. Like when when Tyler Vecti sat down to handwrite this letter, it was a handwritten like kind of a long letter and you know, he's a single guy where does he even get a card and so he he purchased a a get well he, it was a get well card he got this just for me and he sits down and he is so kind to like write out this really sweet letter and uh, like i don't think he would realize this but i would say that was an encounter with God. And I'm not trying to give God all the credit. You know, I sometimes atheists like think think that's what we're saying like uh, now Tyler, t- you know, Tyler's a jerk, but God kind of forced him to like be nice. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying when you are a kind person and you have this moment of you feel inspired or animated, energized to do something that is selfless and kind then you are encountering god even if you wouldn't label it as such and even if you don't realize that 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 is what you're doing i i heard someone say once i think it's a great quote that when we say god is love we're not saying what love is we're saying what no no i'm sorry when we say god is love we're not saying what god is we're saying what love is. We're saying that when when you encounter that that type of love that only humans are capable of, that o- only you know of all the animal kingdom, there's a certain type of selfless agape to use the Greek term love that is it's not self interested and it, it you know it's not about lust or instinct or getting something in return. It's like it's just it's just selfless. It's just you just care for other people when you engage in that type of love you are encountering God because that's what God is. It's just, it's just what he is. And it, it, C.S. Lewis points this out really beautifully. So C.S. Lewis, he did the Narnia Chronicles, and um, he was also a lifelong atheist who he became Anglican Catholic light, Catholic, almost, you know, it, it almost counts. Um, 
so, hang on, Caitlin, could you send a text to get this dog to stop mm-hmm. whining to yeah. the powers that be? <laughs> Sorry, we have a dog outside the studio door. It's a lot. <laughs> okay, I'm embracing <laughs> the chaotic energy. So C.S. Lewis was, he was a lifelong atheist who converted, he was Anglican, Catholic light. And, um, and, and he was in the literal trenches in World War I. So this is a guy who had lived some life. This is a guy who had been around the suffering block, who had seen you know the, the worst of what life has to offer. And C.S. Lewis said very beautifully, I, I think this is in Mere Christianity, because he wrote a lot about his conversion. Um, the, and, and it's not as well known as the Narnia Chronicles, but it, it was actually really a, a beautiful thing. Um, I think he said in Mere Christianity... He said that one of the things that that made him realize that God exists is that we yearn for a world of love and peace and harmony. And again, that kind of agape, selfless love. And and C.S. Lewis said like, well, where would we even get that idea? That, you know, when, when you read human history, it's just all people killing each other, just constantly. Like this group of people killing this group of people. It's, I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, people double crossing you and literally stabbing you and stealing things from you. And so he was like, you know, again, as someone who was in World War I, he, he'd looked around and seen the worst of what humanity had to offer. And he said, you know, the fact that we even sense that there's a better way has to come from something external to this world. It has to come from something external to the human experience because where would we even get the idea that this kind of thing exists or is the preferred way of being? You know, why why not adopt a, a philosophy of survival of the fittest where, you know, we you get rid of the weak and you go to war with weak people or what like why not just do that? Why is it that every culture, every culture has a moral sense that doing good to other people, especially when it's not in your own self-interest, is the highest way to act. Like basically every culture that's ever existed, why, where would they get that idea? And he said, you know, that's God. And he has this, this beautiful quote where he, he talks about how Christianity is, it, it's a fighting religion, meaning that, that we are meant to fight against the, the darkness and the, the difficulty and, and the bad things and the evil and the hatred uh, in the world and, um, and, and fight for that, that love, you know, that selflessness. So all this is to say, that, do the belated tangent alert. <laughs> um, that was a tangent, but... It's because I'm, I'm leading up to a point. The, you know, some of the atheists I know have probably encountered God more profoundly than a lot of the believers I know. They they just didn't know how to label it. Like, I've, I've told a story before. It's funny. This is, this is related um, because it has to do with my blood clotting disorder. Um, my, my health fell apart in my sixth pregnancy. And, um, oh, the hematologist stories I could tell. Um, anyway, uh, so my health fell apart and, and, uh, due to my blood clot related blood disorder related issues, there was an issue when my son was born and, um, and, and I, he almost didn't make it. It was a, it was a very terrible situation. And he was in the neonatal intensive care unit, the the NICU. And I arranged to have him held all the time. That was very important to me because we couldn't hold my son for the first uh, four or five days of his life because he had tubes in his chest. It was terrible to have a newborn baby that could not be held. That's not fun. That's not that was not a good situation and it and it grieved me so deeply that when we could finally hold him again i i, I wanted round the clock help with that and um so i i just set up like a whole train of people see village village i called on my village 
And I just I, I just had people constantly cuddling and snuggling him basically 24 seven that my mother's instinct said that he needed that. And by the way, sure enough, he his health improved rapidly once he was being snuggled and, and held all the time. And um, and and there was this uh, one night, though, where it that the, the night shift wasn't covered and I came back the next morning and he had a an IV in his his little baby head they'd put an IV in his head and you know they they'd said that he you know obviously he didn't like that and I and the nurses were they were very busy there were a lot of babies in the NICU so they they often couldn't hold the babies even when they were crying because they they were short-staffed I mean they couldn't and so I, I was I was devastated when I thought of him getting an IV in his little newborn baby head and then just lying there with no one to hold him. It, it was devastating to me. It just like took me out. Um, and then, so, and my dad happened to call who was lifelong atheist and um, he was just checking in. He knew I was at the NICU and, and I was about to start crying. And I said, yeah, they put this IV in his head and it was terrible. And he said, oh yeah, he, he sure didn't like that. That was not what he wanted to be doing at 3 a.m. And I said, wait, how did you know? And he said, I, I was there. My dad had, um, oh, see, now I'm going to start crying. Oh. Um, my dad had been um, going to the neonatal intensive care unit uh, every night. And I, I didn't know it because he showed up after I left. And, and my dad was not a night owl. I did not get my night owl jeans, jeans from him. Uh, he was the kind of guy who was normally sound asleep by 9.30 p.m. And he knew that I wanted someone to hold the baby. And I, I didn't think I had the night shift covered for this one week. And so without attracting any fanfare, without telling anyone, he just went up to the hospital and he held the baby from, um, from midnight until 6 a.m every night and so he was there when they put in the the IV and he said oh yeah he just cried for a second and then I rocked him and you know he was better and I've I've you know my dad has since passed away and um I often thought like he was so close to God you know he he was so close to Jesus in that moment he just he just didn't realize it um, a f funny story. <laughs> it, I mean, it's not funny, but it kind of is. Um, <laughs> I was. I, I did an event. Um, it, it was a It was. It was a group associated with Billy Graham. See, now I'm hesitant to say any. I'll get banned from the Billy Graham Center now. Um, I, I was. I love these. People. They're great. They're great. So it was you know Protestant, the Billy Graham uh, Center, and they were wonderful. They were wonderful. I like them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we were doing a prayer circle and, and for those of you who don't know the difference like Catholics and Protestants are very different we have very different theology of what constitutes salvation and how does God look on people who you know took different paths it just the whole the whole theology is pretty different but but I, I love and respect them and so we were in a prayer circle and um, my dad had just passed away like they actually didn't think I was going to be able to make it out there um, because because it was so recent and they said we'd we'd like to pray for um, Jennifer's father so it was like 12 people in this prayer circle and they're very solemn and this wonderful man you know was leading it he was like lord jesus we just we just ask you you know to be with jennifer's family in this time and and we know that you know her father is is with you and um because lord jesus we know how much he he loved you and you know was close to you and uh, <laughs> you know they didn't know me uh and i'm like oh <laughs> in a way i mean you know i feel like he he knew god more than he realized um <laughs> And then he stops his prayer and says, um, he says, Jennifer, let, uh, what day was, was your father saved? You know, what, what was the date that he accepted uh, Jesus as his Lord and Savior? And I, I was like, um, uh, he was an atheist. Actually, I should have said something else, but I was just caught off guard. I was like, he was an atheist. And I think in their theology, that means like he's burning in hell like as we oh. speak and so that it just ruined the prayer circle everyone was like oh uh, well um okay so that amen <laughs> you know that's so that was um just just a, a little a little clash of cultures moment but i appreciated the prayers i i thought the prayers were great so um 
I I always felt like my dad was so much closer to God than he realized. And and I think we see this a lot with our friends who aren't believers. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of different reasons that people don't believe. And, and frankly, I, sometimes it's like, uh, you can't blame them. I mean, if they had some of the interactions with Christians that I did growing up, like, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you see how they get there. Um, and yet I, I think they have, um, I think they have these encounters with God that they don't even realize, like Tyler Vecti, just doing that, the kindest thing. And, and sending me that letter. It was just, it was so kind and it was so sweet. And yes, it was of Tyler's own free will. I'm not, I'm not giving God all the credit. Like again, he didn't turn Tyler into a nice robot, but so that was Tyler's free will because Tyler is, is a good, a, a good warm hearted person. Um, but in that moment, I think, I think he encountered God. And, and I think when it's all said and done and you know, our, our atheist loved ones are like on the other side, you know, they've passed on. I think when they encounter God, it he'll actually uh, feel very familiar. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I think, um, I think God will feel very um, familiar to them. And I did not mean to start crying. <laughs> I should be crying because I'm banned from a hematology <laughs> office and I didn't even do anything except for make some jokes about an office that wasn't even their office. That's what I should be crying about. Okay, well, this is a wild ride for this podcast. <laughs> God. Okay, let me look at my note. We have other things to talk about. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, here, this is a good transition out of crying. Caitlin and I and our children went to the symphony oh. <laughs> the other night. And it made me hate white people. How about that for a good transition out of me crying? Okay, so <laughs> the chaotic energy is in full force. We go to um, we go from crying to um, just the the pure hatred that is in my heart um, at this symphony. So listen, the it, the symphony as I experienced it is the most anti village thing I have ever encountered and and i i mean look i understand being an uptight white person better than anyone i i own that game i mean <laughs> i get it and and of course there is a part of me that is wants everything to be sterile and perfect and no one's making any noise and, and no one's bothering me but because i am not a soulless person i have evolved to realize that maybe in order to have a world where we have love and community and acceptance of of all different people and and everyone can encounter the good things in life that might mean that i am just mildly ever so slightly inconvenient sometimes but but the people at the symphony have yet to learn that lesson. So we we take okay, we had what eight kids ages yep. I mean most of them were ages 10 and under. We had one 12-year-old, but we had eight kids and most of them were eight, were ages 10 and under and we wanted them to be able to encounter the symphony. And I want to say I think they were pretty well behaved, oh, yeah. right? So th this is an important thing to say about about village life i i want to make it clear that when when i make statements like we need to welcome children and babies and and on planes and in churches and in symphonies and and we need to be welcoming of the inconveniences that might be caused by them i, I do also believe that part of village life is that parents have a duty to get their children to behave to the best of their ability. So society has a duty to accept children and let them be part of our entertainment and let them be part of our events and deal with a little bit of chaos and noise that comes from that. But on the other hand, parents also have the a, a duty, I would say, to keep their kids from just completely running amok. That's in village life, we all have to work together here. And Caitlin and I are both very big on that. We we don't let our kids, you know, make noise or be crazy. And we're we're very big on if they are in a public place, they need to use manners and be on good behavior and act 
appropriately for public places. Now, when they are in the backyard while we are recording the podcast, they, they, they're maniacs. They are absolute yeah. maniacs. But when we take them to public places, to a restaurant, to a symphony, whatever, we absolutely expect them to be on good behavior. Now, they are still children. So we get them seated in in the symphony seats and they're just they're just wiggling a little bit. It was not bad. They were not kicking seats. I'm I'm huge on that. I hate that when I'm when I'm in a an airplane seat and some some kid is just kicking my seat. I I do not let my kids go anywhere near the other people's yeah. seats. And we had we had a long row that was it was just us and and I think basically no other people. So they weren't even shaking the row and disturbing people. So they they were just kind of wiggling a little bit. I'm so glad that, oh, I'm sorry, Rhonda, Rhonda, <laughs> I'm so glad, okay, the, the cat's out of the bed. I'm so glad that I have Caitlin as a witness. Did we not have people turning around and glaring at the kids? Oh, yeah. When they, they, they weren't yelling, they, they weren't speaking loudly, they, occasionally they would do a little whisper, I mean, seriously, like, five words, whispered, and then they'd be quiet, and then they'd stop, and then they would, you know, shush them, and they would not continue. And then did you say that someone corrected my daughter's posture? Somebody like grabbed her shoulder and said she needed to sit up. I was like, what? If I'd known that, I'd be banned from the symphony for, for, for being too funny. For being too funny. That's, I want to be very clear. I'd be banned from the symphony because they'd be like, your humor is too much. It's too much for this. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, my, um, my attorney is... Okay. What? It, oh. Okay. Uh, so yeah. If if I had known that someone and, and and what did she say? She it was she told my daughter to sit up. Yeah. Sit up straight. Sit up straight. Like, yeah. Her posture was fine. It was it was to, and also who cares? Like yeah. what do you care? And I want to be clear. It's not like she was lying on the floor or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I she was just kind of leaning forward and in fact I think she was trying to see better because there were people in front of her and we have a symphony person telling her to sit up straight yeah. the, oh you guys <laughs> by the way if you heard me commenting on the the studio door opening just a second ago um now Caitlin's car alarm <laughs> is going off so they had to get the key to turn it off okay it's chaotic Your energy chaos. all right it's <laughs> it's like just chaos. chaotic <laughs> energy follows me it's i didn't do anything to set off that alarm the chaos follows me so and here's what killed me about it here's what killed me about these people it, it being so hostile to the concept of children being at the symphony first of all if you like anything any kind of art form you should want the next generation to encounter it like that that makes no sense it's like i i think that this symphony is really great and uplifting um so let's make sure that kids don't know about it let's let's make sure that they never discover it so that this can die with me <laughs> i will take this to the grave my knowledge of the symphony we do not want gen z to know anything about it so first of all that doesn't make sense and and this is by the way when i'm talking about the symphony it's like kind of the same thing as people who are rude to children being in church, like very similar principles here. Um, and, and then this one, this, this is this is a little bit of a different track, but it must be said, it must be said that this symphony, the music was not great. D am I lying, Caitlin? It was it just not lying <laughs> uh, and, and, and the musicians were great we have a yeah, very yeah. talented symphony the people playing the instruments top quality they, they're they're amazing they, they were great the composer um listen I, I i get hard feedback on the on the work that i do all <laughs> the time i know what it is like to be criticized for your art form and something you were really proud of so i say this I say this with all delicateness, but um, the composer might want to go back to the drawing board on this one. Um, this wasn't one of the more famous pieces. That, <laughs> by the way, I'm not talking about like Bach or Mozart. <laughs> that would be, you know, like, no, Beethoven's symphony. Is just, I just didn't. This was not a famous one. Um, I'm sure that this composer has a lot of great things to offer the world. Um, I just think they might want to get some constructive criticism on this particular symphony and th this particular piece. 
um, you know, the guy just like kind of banging on the piano through the whole thing. <laughs> Again, he's also talented, but d- the way the piece was written, it just sounded like a lot of banging with, oh, then now we have some drums and like, oh, there are the woodwind instruments. Like, yeah. I don't know. It it just, it didn't come together. So with all of these people who were, they were acting like they were so attentive and they were just so into it. It's like, I know you're not. I know you don't think this is good. I know you don't because it's this is just not that good. And the only reason you are acting like your attention is so focused is because you are pretentious. That is the only reason. And and like being pretentious is more important to you than maybe, I don't, I don't know, being welcoming of children and not glaring at these kids who, frankly, you could use the distraction because this music kind of sucks. It, <laughs> it does. It, the music kind of sucks. It just wasn't... The, the, the particular pieces that we heard... I'm telling you, I know someone's going to argue with me about this. They're going to be like, Jen, I'm sure it was great and you're just being judgmental. I could survey 10,000 people and... 9,999 of them would be like that That these pieces were not very good. And the one who disagreed would, would be the composer's mom. I mean, <laughs> it, they needed some work. And so all of these people are just acting like they're so riveted. I was looking at their faces. I'm like, come on, mm-hmm. come on. <laughs> it's, it, I, I, I'm just, you know what? Maybe everyone got with their ticket they got two tequila shots and 60 milligrams of Adderall. Maybe I just missed that. Maybe Caitlin and I just didn't get that. Because that's what it would have taken for me to display the attention that all of these people were putting towards this. I mean, it just, it was like one of those things where, you know, you get there and you're like, okay, hmm, well, <laughs> okay, well, this is, you know, and it may, maybe do a little work on this. And so, of course, the kids were, again, well-behaved, but still kids. They they would just kind of wiggle in their seat. You know, a kid would take off a jacket. And these people were acting so perturbed by it. And it's like, this is the best entertainment you're getting tonight, is these (laughs) kids, okay? That, man, I would have given anything for, like, because some of my comedian friends to, like, go up there, like, turn it into a comedy open mic. Like, now, that would have been, that would have been good entertainment. (laughs) But, but so it just, I mean, it was definitely a certain demographic that was there. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. Let's be real. This is, this is Caucasian American culture that we are talking about here. And it just makes me think maybe I I need to go be with my people in Mexico because other (laughs) cultures, other like Mexican culture, um, Italian culture, Nigerian culture, like the, these cultures are much more welcoming of children and like it and and a little bit of like the chaos that comes with it if you were to go to some sort of um you know musical event in mexico i mean like i went to a um like a ballet folklorico in mexico city one time and there were kids there and they were generally well behaved but there were i mean they they would wiggle a little bit and you know somebody would be holding a baby And the baby would make a little bit of noise. And because they have great village culture, once the baby started making more than a little bit of noise, the parent would get up and and take the baby out. But then everyone else, because they understand the concept of familia and not being completely hostile to anyone under the age of 18, they dealt with it. It's like, oh, a baby made a little "Eh," noise. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm not going to freak out about that. I'm not going to give someone a dirty look because more life is more love. In all of these cultures that are village oriented and family oriented, they they understand that more life is more love. And here's the thing is life always comes with chaos. That's why I take it as a as a compliment, this chaotic energy. When you are open to life in any sense of the word, I, and I mean you as an individual experiencing all that life has to offer or open to life like 
have, having as many kids as you kind of feel like you reasonably can before the health department comes in and shuts <laughs> everything down, or you're you're really involved in in your community. You know, you're single, but you're you're involved with your nieces and nephews or your church community or whatever. When you're open to life in 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 any sense of the word, you um you understand that it it comes with chaos. When when you have a culture that is that sees family as a good thing and sees that every baby is hope, you know, at every baby that comes into the world. Wow. Like that's a new human life. That's a new person like made in the image and likeness of God. Like, wow, that's amazing that who knows what this person will do. It's an, it's a new person, a little chubby, tiny new person. <laughs> and that comes with chaos and notice that the more anti life, anti family, anti baby, a culture is the less comfortable they are with chaos. They want everything very sterile and very perfect. I mean, you you even see that in some of the the atheistic regimes, like you know Stalin and you know, th- those guys. Um, some of the different communist societies that you know they they were anti. They were not pro. Um, you know, babies and life and love and, and people really having deep, authentic, messy connections with one another. And they wanted everything very efficient and machine-like and sterile and just kind of, you know, running perfectly smoothly, like perfectly efficiently. And if you go into any of these cultures, like, again, my dad grew up in Mexico. I spent a lot of time in Mexico in my childhood. Not the most efficient culture because... You can't have everything perfect and efficient and welcome everyone and welcome all life. You can't have everything be f- perfect and efficient and, and welcome babies because babies, are, they're unpredictable. You know, maybe you're trying to get out the door to a party and your baby has a diaper explosion. Well, now you're late. It, it's not an efficient way to live. And this also goes into welcoming, let's say, people with special needs. I was thinking about this as I was getting wound up at the symphony. I, I was like, you know, what, what if you have a, um, a child who is, um, they're autistic or they, they have some kind of disability that means that sometimes they, they vocalize things. That happens with, with certain disabilities. Um, you know, some kids, they might occasionally just make a noise or something. Oh, you're not welcome at that symphony. Oh, would it maybe be good for your kid to experience, you know, a symphony and to see live music? Oh, you'll never know because all of these people are going to sit there and glare at you because they had to hear 1.2 seconds of an extra noise that they didn't want to hear tonight. It's horrible. It's it's just it's a horrible culture, and I feel like I have to start a revolution here. I I'm yes. in in a peaceful comedic way. Peaceful, yes. I, well, I to, uh, no a more peaceful bands. A, a, a revolution of love and kindness is what <laughs> I need to start here. Um, I um, I, I'm like I, I was looking around that symphony. Like I have to fix this culture because it is. It is really a problem, and it's it's very. I, I don't know how to speak more delicately than this. It's very white American. It's it's and and that's why I just think. Listen, this podcast is. We have a lot of listeners of all different backgrounds. You know, we've got both people on YouTube. We've got all of <laughs> very wide variety of people listening. Um, I I don't I don't really care what your faith is at all, but I do think that you should all just convert to Catholicism because it's good for you. Catholicism is so good for uptight white people because it forces you to be a little more family oriented. It forces you to be a little more, you know, chilled out, open to inefficiency, open to life, open to mess. Like if you look at the Catholic parts of Europe, they are the only parts of Europe that you will see that there there's that, um, you know, you, you could bring a baby to an event and if the baby makes a little bit of noise, people aren't going to flip out. The only places you see that in Europe are like the deeply Catholic places. So, you know, I guess that's really just my point. You should all just go ahead and convert to Catholicism. <laughs> just do it because like, it's good for our culture. It makes our culture more open to village life and all of the mess and inefficiencies that come with it because this this current culture that we have especially in the West, in, in America, in Canada, in the vast majority of Europe. Um, it is so anti-village, it's wild. And 
and, and you know who really pays the price for that is it, it's women. I mean, it's essentially an anti-woman culture because let's be real, who who is paying the price for having a culture where you can't bring a baby anywhere without being scorned, that you can't engage in any kind of entertainment without people glaring at you for having a baby. Let's face it, it's women, and it's especially women. Um, you know, like I, I know a gal, um, friend of a friend, not that long ago, that she had an unexpected pregnancy. Dad was not part of the picture, and she stepped up and was like, all right, it, I have no support from this guy, but I'm I'm doing it. We're, we're doing this thing. And she also did not have support from her family. And so, you know, what what can this woman do for fun with her baby? She has she has no village. She has no husband who's part of the picture. Uh, I know for a fact that she's not welcome at stand up comedy shows because mm-hmm. all of these theaters that I go to have a no baby policy, mm-hmm. which I have to go to battle about every single time. And I often lose that battle. And I'm like, oh, you just wait. You just wait. You just wait. When the comedy millions come in. I will I will win battles with all of these theaters and I will be like babies that you, babies are welcome at my show that a little bit of baby noise is not going to like mess up my precious jokes like it's going to be fine. So yeah, so if if you're a single mother with no village, um okay, you can't go to a symphony for sure. Yeah. Uh can't bring your baby to that, can't bring it to a comedy show. Nobody wants you in movie theaters. You can't go anywhere because people will be hostile to you if you bring your baby on a plane and god forbid it starts crying on a plane. I oh. mean it's so stupid and ironic that we live in this culture that talks all these big words, all these big words about how pro woman it is. And yet with the completely anti-life anti-village tenor that is that completely dominates our our entire culture it's actually the most anti-woman thing that you could do it it is a completely anti-woman setup because it's women who end up dealing with all of this also again if you have a child with special needs who maybe makes some noise occasionally or has a, a a big heavy wheelchair that it just it might block someone's view a little bit at the symphony or like there might not be a place for it let's face it i i mean i know many dads are great and step up but come on anyone who's lived any kind of life knows that just there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that says that when when you have special needs kids, it is a lot of, you know, it, it is largely women who end up taking care of them. And so when we have these absolutely um, anti-village policies and feelings that every form of entertainment you ever you ever encounter has to be perfectly silent you can't have kids taking off jackets or wiggling in seats ultimately these are very anti-woman sentiments and so and and i just know you know we're we're at we're at the in in the particular city that we are in i guarantee you that most of the people in that building had some feminist bumper stickers (laughs) on their they're pro-woman they're pro-woman and yet they're sitting there glaring at our kids for like taking off a jacket during a symphony that was not even that good. It's it's just so <laughs> ironic that all of these people they they just they think that they're so pro woman, and then they have these completely anti woman anti village policies. Let let me summarize it this way: to be categorically anti chaos of any sort, you know, like you you get, there can't be any noise, there can't be anyone wiggling in seats. To be anti-chaos is to be anti-woman. No, let me rephrase that. To be anti-chaos is to be anti-village. And to be anti-village is to be anti-woman. And that's what I was thinking about instead of listening to the symphony. So, um, that man, that was crazy. Okay, <laughs> so did I get everything? Uh, yeah, oh, <laughs> Okay, there, there. We'll talk about Caitlin's website and the oh. exciting things that she is doing. Um, now we won't associate it with this mess. Um, <laughs> you know what, guys? I'm just going to wrap up here because um, I've been banned from an unnamed hematology office, and um, I'm about to run out of the medicine that I'm on. And so now I urgently have to figure out what I'm going to do about that. Join my Patreon, <laughs> Patreon.com. Slash this is Jen. We we had a real hot fire 
Village House Hustle episode this week. Patreon.com slash This Is Jen. And I will be back with you next week with more chaos. (laughs) 